Here at Shaun of the Size, we're keeping our hands sharp with the help of Case Knives, the sponsor of this episode. A tradition in my family for generations, Case Knives are. My granddad used to say the best cure for idle hands was to build something. In today's day and age, everything's done with a click, a swipe, or a tap. So put away the screens, pull your hands out of your pockets, and put them to work with the help of a Case Knife. Hey, you are listening to Sean of the South, and I'm your host tonight, Sean Dietrich, and man, we've got a great show lined up for you here. We're coming to you live to the podcast airway from the radios all over this fine nation. There's a group of folks you see behind me here fixing to play music for you tonight is the Big Cedar Fever, everybody. Big Cedar Fever. our program is brought to you by Visit North Alabama or NorthAlabama.org. Travel to visit the 16 North Alabama counties that make the Yellowhammer State what it is. Blunt County, Cherokee County, Colbert County, Coleman County, DeKalb County, Etowah County, Franklin County, Jackson County, Lauderdale County, Lawrence County, Limestone County, Madison County, Marion County, Marshall County, Morgan County, Winston County. <laughs> you can visit the Horton Mill Bridge just off Alabama 75. About five miles north of Oneona, built in 1935, all built by hand by craftsmen. Or how about the barbecue trail? Trek across North Alabama on a holy pilgrimage of saturated fat and slow-smoked pork. Other states might do their barbecue a little bit differently than Alabama. And that's not to say that they do it wrong, but that is to say that they absolutely don't do it right. There's the North Alabama Train Depot Trail. There's the depots across this state. Tour the historic Huntsville Depot that still reflects the graffiti on the interior walls written by Civil War soldiers. Ride the rails into history. Or visit seven state parks that'll make you believe in the magic and the magic of this wonderful state. Watch a sunset over the Tennessee River at Joe Wheeler State Park or visit the Rickwood Caverns, a mile of underground caves that'll either dazzle you or scare the ever-loving bejesus out of you. 
Doesn't matter what you do, you can do it better at North Alabama. Look them up online at visit North Alabama or NorthAlabama.org or if you're looking for hashtags, visit North AL. Now let's have another tune from Big Cedar Fever, everybody. Big Cedar Fever. read you a little bit of our mail tonight, a little bit of our mail sent in to us from listeners all over this fine nation who had nothing better to do than to sit down and write a few words together, a few sentiments telling us, telling us something nice or something personal about themselves or to tell us about a birthday. Myra Scott from North Carolina writes, I'm writing to tell you how much I look forward to your columns each day and your radio shows. You brought back my beloved South to me. You stirred long forgotten memories of my childhood visiting my North Carolina relatives, and I just wanted you to know that my mother will be 94 years old on January 15th. She loves to listen to your radio shows. She grew up in the foothills of North Carolina during the Great Depression and has worked hard all her life. My father was a Southern Baptist minister, so you know she's a strong woman, able to endure all those years serving alongside him. Her name is Beulah. I would appreciate it if you'd wish her a happy birthday on your show. She will love it. Well, dear Beulah, I just want to wish you on January the 15th a happy 94th birthday from everybody here tonight. Ty Wilders from Sanford, Texas. 
Hi, Sean, I'm writing this as a sick person. I have a cold and my kids just left home for school and my husband's having to take care of me and I just wanted to say thanks to him. He canceled a work trip to take care of me and my kids during this cold season. Even though it's not that bad, I know I'm a big old baby. I have spent a whole life taking care of kids just like any mother does, and now it's kind of nice having the tables turned for a change. Happy New Year to you. Chase Donnell, Birmingham, Alabama. I've always loved dogs, but my job has never allowed for me to have one. It would have just been a bad idea with as much as I worked and as crazy as my hours were, but, but I changed jobs recently. To something a whole lot less stressful, and the first thing I did was go out and buy a dog. He's a rescue, but he looks like a black lab, and he's cool. I named him King just because I thought you'd like to know about a guy who names his dog after Elvis. Susan Pierce from Columbus, Georgia. I like your show. My mom and I played, my mom played it for me when I was in the airport on the way to Spain to visit family I have never met before. So I downloaded several of your episodes after hearing one, and I listened to them on the flight, and I even fell asleep with your voice in my ear. And now I feel like you're a friend after all those hours of listening to you talk. So now you're international. Seriously, just wanted to say thanks for the show. I enjoyed it. Dear Susan, from your American brother, gracias, amiga. Bailey Miranda, Sedona, Arizona. Sean, I hope you're having a happy new year. I just wanted to say hello from the desert. My son lives in Little Rock, Arkansas, and he listens to your show religiously. And I'm sending him a shout-out for a happy birthday. He'll be 42, and that makes me feel so old to say that. Anyway, keep up the good work. His name is Brian. So, dear Brian, from everyone here tonight, happy 42nd birthday to you and yours. Try not to get too sad if you notice white hair beginning to appear or if you notice that hair is beginning to disappear. It's all part of the game. Kayla and John McPherson, Tampa, Florida. Sean, we're going on our first cruise this month, and I am terrified because I am a seasick kind of guy. I can't even ride in a car because I get motion sick. So this week I went to the doctor to get on the patch, which if you don't know, is a kind of medical patch they put on your shoulder that's supposed to prevent motion sickness. So I guess I'm going to suffer through it no matter what happens one way or the other because we always have wanted to go on a cruise, but I've never done it because of my problem, and I feel kind of bad for holding my wife back all these years. So here goes nothing. Please... If you have a few moments, send me some good vibes, Sean. Dear John, from everybody here in this theater tonight, I'd like to quote to you the the immortal words of the Beach Boys. Good, 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 good vibrations. Chelsea, Clarksdale, Mississippi. I am having a rough year this year. I don't want to bore you with the details, but my cat Wilson died just this year. And I named him after that movie, Survivor which, if you haven't seen it, is where the guy who's stranded on a desert island makes friends with a volleyball that has the name Wilson on it because he's lonely and has nobody to be friends with. Well, I was that lonely when I got Wilson. He made it to 19 years old, and that's pretty impressive for a cat. I had to make that horrible decision to put him down. It was months ago that I did it, but it still feels like yesterday. I can't seem to get over how sad my house is without him around. He was my buddy, and he helped me. He helped me get through life. That said, I just wanted to tell somebody how I feel. I think I'll get another cat, but I'm going to be truthful. I'm afraid that it will be like being unfaithful to Wilson. Sorry for rambling. Your faithful listener, Chelsea. Dear Chelsea, I speak from my, own, my experience, which is limited. But if I did have anything to tell you, I would say, get a cat. In my opinion, life is made for loving animals. Heidi Breland, Asheville, North Carolina. It's four in the morning while I write this, and I am engaged to an 
awesome man who popped the question to me last night at a brewery. How can it get any better, right? We love craft beer and we love each other. When my beer got to the table, there was something in the bottom of the glass. I didn't even notice it until I was halfway through my beer. A humble ring with a diamond in it. I have known he was going to ask me for a while, and I've been waiting patiently for him to do it without saying a word. We listened to your podcast for the first time last year together in the truck on the way to visit my parents in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. And I knew when I heard you reading mail that if he ever got around to asking me to marry him, I would want you to announce it because you are my kind of people, Sean. Well, dear Heidi, from everybody here tonight, congratulations and may you have many happy returns in your life together. John Fortnite, Auburn, Alabama. Sean, I'm the kind of guy you write about. I was a kid who had nobody except my uncle, who was never there, and my sister, who I raised on my own. But we made it through life, and I'm optimistic because of our experiences. I'm 40, and my sister's 36. We're the only family each other has, but my sister's been away for a few years. Her husband's job has led her out of the country sometimes. And this year, my sister's husband has taken a job that brings them back home, and I'm so excited that our kids will get to grow up as cousins and that my sister and I can just watch it all happen. Our small family has grown by leaps and bounds. I have two kids, and my sister has four. So that's six kids all together with me and my sister and our spouses. Sean, that's ten people total, which is a long way from the way we grew up, which was just the two of us. From two people to ten in only a few years. It's amazing how good things grow when love is sprinkled all over them. Thanks for the show. It's my companion to work on the Monday morning commute. Dear John, thank you for the letter. I myself have often thought that people are like plants. And if you bury them in dirt and manure, it smells bad. Eventually, they'll sprout tall, and they will blossom if we give them enough time. And eventually, they will also cover a hillside and adorn it with nothing but beauty. And also, some people like me are like scrawny little trees. And what I mean by that is no matter what life throws at us, it still takes us forever to actually grow up. And that's letters from our listeners. Let's have another tune here from Big Cedar Fever, everybody. Big Cedar Fever. Said 
she's not leaving, she's already gone. They said she's not leaving, she's already gone. She's not leaving, she's already I was on my way home from mid-Alabama after doing a, a talk up there for a room full of Methodists and Baptists. They'd all gotten into one congregation, and they spent a weekend together. And so they were all hanging out together in this one big auditorium. And I was, I was put up in a real nice hotel, real nice hotel. I was so nice, in fact, I had, to, I had to pick up the phone and call my cousin, Ed Lee. I said, Ed Lee, you're never going to believe this place. He said, what, what, where are you? I said, I'm in a hotel called the Hilton Gardens Inn. He said, oh, my God. He said, tell me, tell me, is it true? I said, is what true? He said, I've heard that they've got, they've got towels and robes so plush you can hardly get your suitcase shut. A little man came to the hotel and he escorted me to the auditorium and I was supposed to, to tell stories for Baptists and Methodists that would not offend either, either group. Well, that's very, very hard because Methodists take pride in, in being offended by certain things and Baptists take pride in being offended by certain things. This is a point of, of pride for them and, and both their sets of certain things are different. And while I stood on that stage holding a little cordless microphone, I looked across the audience of people and I thought, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> and I realized while I was looking at these people, you can tell a Methodist from a Baptist just by looking at them. <laughs> you know the Baptist and the Methodists. And likewise, you also know who those people are who've got their heads bowed. In, in a reflective, meditative mood. I know who those people are. They're the Presbyterians. Very reflective people. My mother used to say, Presbyterians are Baptists who want to drink but can't afford to be Episcopalian. <laughs> and then you look over in the corner and you can see those other people and they've got their hands raised and their lips are gently moving ever so slightly. These are people who are Praying in tongues, these are the holiness brethren, our Pentecostal friends. And you can look around this audience and you can see, you know which man is Baptist and you know which people drink at their Christmas parties. <laughs> well, I gave a talk and I, I'm not sure how good I did because uh, they were not nearly as free to laugh as, as a lot of people that I normally speak to, uh, they were a lot like you. <laughs> and when I left, I felt kind of defeated, and I was driving along the road, I-65 South, and I saw one of my favorite things on I-65. It's more than just an item on the side of the road. It is a memory, a gold-plated nostalgic memory. It is a billboard poised right on the county line of Chilton County and Otago County. And it has a little red devil on this billboard with horns and a pointy tail and a big old pitchfork. And his, his back legs look like the hind section of a donkey. <laughs> and the red and black text on this board says, go to church or the devil will get you. <laughs> oh, I love this billboard. And I can tell you do too. I love it. I was raised Southern Baptist, and this is a holy landmark to my people. People have been known to make pilgrimages just to get to this billboard. I was 16 years old, going on a spring break trip to Birmingham, Alabama with a few friends. The city was just about empty because everybody was already down here at the beach. They were going to Panama City. They were going to Destin. And my friends and I would go to Birmingham, and the city would just be totally to ourselves. That's where we were going. And we were driving along, and we saw this billboard. We'd all seen it before in our lives. We all knew about it. And my buddy D Daniel said, stop, stop. 
And my friend pulled over the car and Dana hopped out. He had a little wind up camera, Polaroid camera. Back then we didn't have the cell phones that you could take instant, you know, snapshots of your, of your linguine at dinner. He said, come on, let's all take a picture. And before anybody could contest it any further, they were all running across the road, hiking over that guardrail, and they were posing in front of this billboard in the tall grass. Cars were zipping and zipping on each side of us. It sounded like someone was about to lose their life. The hazard lights were, were flashing on our vehicle. And my buddy Danny said, oh, my God, how am I going to take this picture and be in it at the same time? Well, this was a problem. This was a, a problem. We didn't have selfie cameras. We had Polaroids that were about the size of a football. And in order to take a selfie, you would have had to have an arm like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And, and it would have had to have been as long as the St. Louis Arch. And so we set it on the ground about 10 feet in front of us. And we took one Polaroid, and it just was of our feet. And so we got a little rock that we'd found, and we, we propped the camera upward, and it was pointing straight upward, and we took another picture. We all stood together with arms around each other, and it, it just got the top of the billboard. It got the devil's head. <laughs> Many people love this billboard for a different reason. Many people love this billboard because when they're driving, when they're driving toward Florida, when they see this billboard, it means that they are about to spend a week on the sand sipping alcoholic beverages. <laughs> it means that the beach is near. The beach is near a place where even the Southern Baptists can find themselves perched in the sand, drinking from little fruity looking glasses with frilly pieces of, of mango sticking out of the top and, and, and fancy looking toothpicks and the, the rim of the glass is coated in salt and they can listen to music that they would never listen to around people who, who they would listen to it back home like Jimmy Buffett and uh, the Beach Boys and they can say words that they wouldn't say around their church lady friends because this is the beach and there are no rules at the beach. So they see this sign, this sign of the devil, and they don't feel fear for judgment and hail, fire, and brimstone and ultimate damnation. They only feel love and joy and peace and kindness when they look at that picture of Beelzebub. <laughs> I was driving past that sign, and I got this call from my mother on my cell phone. I answered it. She asked how I was doing. I told her how I was doing. She said, I heard you spoke, you know, for Methodists and Baptists. How'd that go? I said it was fine. She said, did you convince any Methodists to, to get full, fully immersed? I said, no, ma'am, I don't think I did. But I did convince a few Baptists to get the tops of their heads graced with a little bit of water. My mother was telling me about our family. My mother's role in our family is the communications supervisor. She mans the telegraph, and, the, and she, she keeps everybody updated on what's going on. She told me about my Uncle John. He'd, he'd gotten a new porch built on his RV. It was made out of reclaimed plywood that had been salvaged from an old dock down at the harbor. And he had used this to build a porch. The porch already had mold and barnacles on it, so it already looked like it was dilapidated and falling apart the moment after he built it. <laughs> Which suits my Uncle John just fine, who lives in a 1958 Dodge Champion RV that's a little bit lopsided. He had to build the porch a little bit lopsided to go along with his, his RV. She told me about my cousin Ed Lee's son, John John, who had been asked to lead the prayer in his first grade Sunday school class and he had said our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name I kingdom come that will be done on earth as it is in heaven and when he got to that part that said lead us not into temptation he said lead me not into temptation I can find the way myself <laughs> he's a wild kid and then my mother told me my mother told me about my sister she said, have you heard about Lucy? Now, Lucy is my sister's child. She was born about 10 days ago. She was five pounds of 14 ounces. I said, no, I hadn't heard about her. She said, she's in the hospital. They think she might have meningitis. It's serious. They just did a spinal tap and they've got her 
got her housed in the hospital. She said, you might want to call your sister. And I pulled over on the side of the interstate. I pulled right over. And I was looking right at that billboard of, that, of, that, of Satan himself. I listened to my mother talk, and I hung up the phone, and I thought about my sister. My sister and I have always been close. That's what fatherless kids find someone to, to bond with. Somebody who can help them talk through growing up together. My sister was that person for me. When my father died, I was 12, and my sister was five years old. We became close friends. And my earliest memory of my sister at that period of life, after my father just died, was a little girl who was so blissfully unaware of sadness and and morose things. A girl who was happy even though the world was falling apart around us. And I can remember my sister crawling up on a big round bale of hay, standing on top like she's Wonder Woman, and leaping off and falling right onto her belly and then laughing about it. And I came running because I thought this girl had gone nuts. And my mother, she was rapping on the kitchen window behind us, and she said, Knock that off. Knock that off. You're going to jostle your insides and you're going to make yourself constipated. (laughs) My mother had this unnatural fear of constipation. She was always, always very afraid of constipation. And my sister crawled up to the top of that round bale of hay. And she jumped off again. And she fell splat on the ground. Belly flopped on purpose. And she laughed again. And I said, what are you doing? And she looked at me and she grinned and she unzipped her winter coat. And underneath her coat, she had about 10 layers of clothes on. It looked like she had about six inches of padding. She said, I can't even feel it. I can't even feel it. And I remember that smiling girl with the rosy cheeks from being a little bit too cold. I gave her a call on my cell phone. She talked to me with a tired voice. I could tell she was worn out. She said, I've been at the hospital since early morning, and I'm going to have to spend the night tonight, and probably tomorrow and the next night too. And I just looked at the image of Satan looming down upon me, (laughs) and I decided that I would go to the hospital instead of go home, which was about two hours out of the way. My car was already packed. Why not? I had a suitcase full of stolen bathrobes and stolen bath towels. I drove along and I got, to, I got to the hospital. I went upstairs and I, I went to the pediatric unit and I saw my sister sitting in the corner. She was holding little baby Lucy, five pound, 14 ounce Lucy with pink skin, and little scrunched up face together and, and tiny little ears and tiny little nose and her eyes were closed. She was sleeping. She had an IV running out of her head and an oxygen nose piece wrapped around her ears and a heart monitor beeping. And my sister stood to, to hug me with one arm while she held Lucy. And I could tell that my sister was shot emotionally and physically. And a nurse came in while we were hugging. And this nurse said, how you doing, mama? My sister said, oh, good. She said, is she, is she starting to eat, mama? And that word, mama, I looked at my sister And I did not see a mama, even though she's a mother of two beautiful children and a dedicated wife and a homemaker and a professional woman who works from can to can't. I didn't see mama. I saw a girl in pigtails. A girl who had a a missing tooth up front when she was just a little old baby. A girl who used to jump off around bales of hay and land square on her belly and laugh about it because she was a little bit loose upstairs. After my father died, my sister asked me if I would sleep on the floor beneath her bed. And so that first night after my father died, I slept on a pallet of quilts and pillows on a hard floor beneath her bed while she slept on the mattress. And I looked up and I could see her hand hanging off the mattress. And she was sleeping and making that gentle purring, snoring sound she used to do. And I did this every night until I was 16 years old. 
I slept at the foot of her bed in case she would have a nightmare and need somebody to tell her it was going to be okay. And often that would be me. She would reach her hand off the bed, and I would reach upward and grip her hand and say, it's all right, it's all right. Of course, I was just pretending. You know, I wasn't a man, I was just a boy. But I'd grown, grown so used to pretending to be a man for her and for my mother. And I can remember one night when my sister was just a little girl, and I was 16 years old, freshly 16. And she woke up one night, she shot forward in her bed, and she started screaming. And she gripped her side, and she said, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. And I flipped on the light, and I said, what? She said, I'm dying. And she was holding her, her side right here to the left of her belly button, leaning forward, and she was moaning and howling. I said, what's wrong? She said, I feel like someone's stabbing me. I'm dying. And she got off the bed and she got onto the floor and she started writhing on the floor and moaning in a a pitch I'd never heard her moan before. This was the same pitch that most Pentecostals use in the middle of a church service. (laughs) My mother came running. She ran into the room. She touched my sister's belly and she touched my sister's forehead. She said, oh, she's fine. She's just constipated. (laughs) My sister said, I'm not. I'm dying. I'm dying, my mother said. I got some castor oil downstairs. It'll take away that feeling all all together. (laughs) My mother always believed that her children were constipated. Her entire life, she she spent as a vigilante against bowel blockage. This is the reason I never had any female prospects of mine visit the house at that age. Because I was afraid my mother would invite them in, make them a little, little cup of tea, and sit them down in the den and ask them about their morning constitutional movements. <laughs> I took my sister and I, in my arms and I walked down the stairs with her while she was wrenching forward and I loaded that pigtailed girl into the back seat of my mother's car and I fired up the engine. And I shot across town. I shot across Walton County and Okaloosa County all the way to the Fort Walton Beach Medical Center. And we walked inside. I was holding her in my arms. And that receptionist looked at me and she said, what's wrong? I said, I think my sister is having a problem. She said, what's the problem? My sister said, I'm dying. I'm dying. The woman said, she's a little dramatic, ain't she? So we went to the waiting room, my sister and I. My sister curled up next to me. She had that silky hair. And I was so scared. I was so scared. And my sister said, what's going to happen to me? I said, you're going to be okay. Because that's what adults say. Even if they don't know it or they don't believe it, that's what they say. I was scared. I've always hated doctors. I've always been terrified that they're going to come in from the back room and say, Mr. Dietrich, I've got some good news. They're going to name a disease after you. I said, sir, it's going to be just fine. I know it. I know it with all my heart. I know you're going to be okay. She said, how do you know? I said, because I'm your brother, and brothers seem to know these things. Finally, the doctor called us back to the room. We went into his back exam room. He touched the belly a few times. He touched the forehead. He said, oh, I got some good news. And I braced myself. He said, It's just a vestigial organ problem. I looked at him and I said, do what? He said, oh, this is just the simplest thing in the world. It's our appendix. And all we got to do is cut that sucker out. It's the easiest thing in the world. And I about fainted. I said, cut it out? He said, oh, I do it. I do it every day, sometimes four or five times a day. It's going to be fine. My sister looked at me. She said, am I going to be okay? I said, you're going to be just fine. And I wanted her to believe it. And the doctor took her away. And I sat in that waiting room, twisting my hands together, wondering what was going to happen to that little pigtailed girl. And it only took a few minutes. And they wheeled that girl back into that exam room. And she was eating ice cream cones, one ice cream cone for each hand, licking one side, then the other, to make sure each side got an equal amount of licks. And my sister grinned at me with that missing tooth, and she said, guess what? I said, what? She said, the doctor says, I'm going to be okay. And I smiled at her. I almost started crying. 
I said, that's great, sir. I knew it. I told you. She said, and guess what else? I never even felt it. I never even felt it. The doctor came in and he looked at us and he patted her on the head. He said, yeah, she, she pulled through like a champ. She pulled through like a champ. My sister said, and I'm good forever now? He said, forever. He said, as long as you eat a diet that's high in dietary fiber, I don't see any reason why you shouldn't live well at least until your upper 40s. <laughs> and I sat there with my sister that night in Fort Walton Beach Medical Center in a vinyl chair beside her bed like I'd been doing since my father died. And she fell asleep in that room in her hospital bed with her hand dangling off that bed and me holding her hand. And I looked out the window up at the stars and at the moon. And I wondered about our life and I wondered what was going to happen to us if we were going to be okay. And my mother was sitting beside me in that hospital room and she placed her arm around me and she said, it's going to be okay. Sixteen years old, I was barely old enough to drive. Here I am pretending to be a man for the women in my life. And that's how I was when I watched my sister hold baby Lucy. Meningitis, it was scary for my sister. But I had to pretend to be a man. And even though I am biologically a man, sometimes I just feel like a boy. And I said to my sister, I believe it's going to be okay. I believe it's going to be okay. And when they sent my little niece, five pound, 14 ounce niece home with a clean bill of health. <laughs> my sister called me and she said, guess what? The doctor said it's going to be okay. I said, I knew it was. I knew it was. Life is so short. And it's scary how forgettable we are in the large scheme of life because we are so small in this big universe. A man lives his whole life. And when it's all said and done, the only thing left is this little obituary in the newspaper. And this little stone with his name on it and a few numbers indicating when he was born and when he died. It's too short to believe that things aren't going to work out okay. It's too short. It's too short not to walk through life knowing that your glass is not just half full, but, but running over I'm trying to heed the advice of the wise woman who raised me into adulthood. And she believed it's going to be okay. That and that it was important to make sure you eat enough dietary fiber because you don't want to suffer a severe case of constipation. Hey, thank you very much for having me tonight. It's been a wonderful pleasure. Happy New Year to everybody. Happy New Year. Hey, thanks for listening to Sean Up the South. I've been your host today, Sean Dietrich and Man. It's been a bona fide pleasure if I do say so myself. This episode was brought to you by Case Knives, a tradition of my family dating back to my granddaddy who once said the only way to cure idle hands is to build something. So keep your hands sharp this season with a Case Knife. That wonderful music you heard behind me today was Big Cedar Fever, a string swing band out of Central Texas that specializes in classic western swing and jazz, three-part harmonies, and tight musical arrangements that draw listeners in, only to be taken taken away by the classic style and lyrics that are a relic to another time and place. To find anything more about what they do, visit BigCedarFever.com and while you're there, take the time to download their new album. You will not regret it. To find anything more about what I do, you can visit SeanOfTheSouthShow.com and there you can find archived episodes dating all the way back to our first one to this one you just heard. And while you're there, I hope you take the time to drop me a line and tell me about your birthday announcements, wedding invitations, church potluck socials, and ice cream parties, and I'll do my best to read them over the air for my friends because I love to do that stuff for my friends. And speaking of friends, friends, some mistakes are too much fun only to make once. Adios.